Hey, how y'all doing? Let's get started. Ooh, yes. Okay, okay. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, Doki, let's do it. Versus Tarash. Nineteen twenty three. Rubenstein versus Tarash. Curls bad. Very perfect. Okay. We're in the new section. We're in uh, chapter six, winnable. And the new section is positional, not material. There are many, many examples of that. <coughs> A, pawn, a pass pawn, a positional advantage, turns out to be superior to an extra pawn. A material advantage, yet the golden rule is different, uh, difficult for many uh, learners to accept. Part of the reason is that they're confused by the w somewhat vague somewhat imposing word positional. Hey, how you doing? If uh, we replace it with non-material, they'll have an easier time uh, grasping the positional position like the following that's right here. So there's not much um, difference. The material is equal here, but there's a positional advantage. White has a big positional advantage. Sorry, a big non-material, non-material edge because of his superior uh, superiority on the light squares. A master sitting in White's chair will try to shift his pieces around and around because it's so hard for Black to defend H7 and G8. He doesn't have to calculate long variations to determine whether there is a forcing win. He feels there is some, there is a likely win as long as he can can keep making credible threats. Uh, that's enough for him to continue with confidence. White begins with the move knight uh, queen to uh, d5 here. Queen d5 of course you're seeing that there's two there's two threats. There's attack here and there's also a potential uh, infiltration uh, here that's an idea and if the knight moves you always have a back you have these two ideas here back here or here. So you, you have it you have a lot of different play. He threatens queen takes uh, e5, of course, but his main idea is uh, like what we're talking about also. Uh, 
queen to uh, f f7. Followed by the decisive check or checkmate idea on f8. Black's uh, difficulty uh, difficulties are literalized uh, by uh, <clears throat> queen f6. This natural move meets both threats but leaves the knight unprotected. White, white would reply by. What move would white reply by? <clears throat> Stop now if you're watching this pre-recording. I mean, uh, if you're watching this uh, pre-recording, if you're watching this uh, on uh, a recording on Chess Cruncher TV on my the YouTube uh, um, website, and uh, stop it now and find out what the best move for White is here. Okay, if you want to continue, just keep listening. All right, the best move is actually surprisingly Queen uh, B5 exclaim. If you uh, if you saw that move, congratulations, because you're threatening mate. <clears throat> you're threatening two things: your fork and the queen. I mean the uh, d8 square for mate, which with the queen after intercept, then the queen takes its mate, and you're attacking the knight on b8. So black has to conti continue with with two threats: queen takes, like yep, what we talked about. And then e8. So both uh, black could meet one of the threats with uh, queen to e6 check. <clears throat> uh, by playing queen e6 check. Then comes g4, <coughs> the attack, um, this, this, uh, the knight is lost after knight to uh, d7 because of uh, bishop f5, our knight a6, Bishop f5 again. And <coughs> Queen c8 can't be played. If queen uh, c8, then you have uh, queen takes. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you have queen takes e5. White would then be close to a forced win and can finish off his opponent if uh, knight d7, which is actually a mistake here. <coughs> Excuse me, with queen to f5, which is a pin on the queen, and then you're threatening mate, the pin. So, so what happened here was what um, after d5, queen c7. Could be played. Black avoided his fate by choosing. <coughs> excuse me. Avoided this fate by choosing Queen C7 instead of uh, um, Queen F6. So this is kind of what was played in the game, but these are variations. Instead of uh, Queen F6, right back at the previous diagram, he protected the knight and the e pawn. This way, but leaves the king side vulnerable to the attacks that we thought about. <clears throat> so what um, the bishop does here is prepares a bishop to f5 exclaim. I know you saw that move. 
He needs to do that because of the immediate queen e6. For the, for the immediate queen e6 uh, setup. And, and also this allows if queen d7. I test you right here. This is what we're talking about. If uh, queen e, then you have queen uh, d7, which is an exclaim move here. And this now makes the position close to drawn. So that's why they uh, bishop f5 um, f was played so that the queen can come here. And if queen tries that, queen takes, knight takes, and then bishop takes. And you'd be up a whole piece in that line. <clears throat> hmm. So knight c6 was played. Black found a defense in knight c6. His idea is to meet uh, bish queen e6 with knight to uh, e7, and then queen f7, queen d8, and then this is kind of the idea that they were talking about. <clears throat> here, 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 and queen d8, not, and they're holding at this point. Black's holding. With at least temporarily they're covered. But, and we're going to go back and um, the queen took care of that with queen to uh, c4 here. This uh, is a really strong, really, really strong move. I know you, you, uh, you saw that. Because what the idea is, is you're pinning the queen and you're threatening bishop e4 at this point. You're keeping all the threats alive, every threat. But with such a huge positional edge, those light squares, white, should be able to make progress with the simple threat. The one choice he chose was queen c4, and hello, victory is coming. He threatens to play like what we talked about, uh, queen, bishop e4, and he wins. Black tried queen d6. But then came the final blow. What was what was the final blow? There's a two more there's two more moves after this one. I mean one more move after this one for both sides. <coughs> White to move and basically you're winning at this point. Stop right now. And you can stop the recording if you're watching this after it's recorded and uh, see if you can solve it or you can continue with us. Okay, we're going to start now. Queen F7 check. <coughs> this idea is strong. Black could resign in, in the view of this. Bish, Queen uh, D8. And then the next move you had to have seen was queen g6. And this is uh, going to be a checkmate view. So if you go back here after this move, if black tried this, this is a, this is a line that could potentially be uh, played here. h5. Queen e6, knight e7, queen f, f7 exclaim, and then if queen uh, d8, then you have queen takes h5 check, and then you're threatening uh, checkmate.
and then on this one here, if the queen tries um, queen f6, queen e8 check, or if knight to um, e7, and then queen f, uh, f8 check. And then if the knight intercepts, then you just, uh, I think you can pick up the queen at this point. And then the game is over anyways, at that point. Okay, back to this move right here that they were talking about. Um, queen d5. If you looked, if you looked up the game, that game, you'd find another instructive point just before queen d5. White uh, swapped a pair of rooks. He did did it because without a rook, excuse me, Black's first rank becomes vulnerable to checkmate. But usually, the player with a positional are as uh, opposed to material advantage will avoid trains. A master would know, for instance, that a trade of either the rook or the queen would uh, vaporize white's winning chances in the following position. So here we go. This is another one we're going to be uh, heading into. I can't wait. This is so great. Gotta love it. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yay. All right. I'm glad we're getting into some of the end games that Andrew Solstice is doing. Because end game is a vital point that you have to study. Okay, white controls more space. What? Controls more space? Really? Re really means, really mean is the white can put more pieces safely on lots, more squares than black. So basically white controls more space which allows white to control, uh, put their pieces better placed, betterly placed. In black. Most of these squares are on the king side, where uh, the king f6 is uh, a slight, uh, slightly weakened the king side. It is true that white has uh, weaker pawns on, than black on a2 and c4. But one more time, a king counts. A king counts more. From an, from from experience, White knew that the most important factor in a heavy piece endgame is king vulnerability. Therefore, White's non-material advantage means his best winning chance chance lies in a kingside attack, and this has this is a uh, I want you to stop right here. You're White. And stop the recording if you're watching it after it's been recorded and see if you can see the exclaim move for white. Okay. If you uh, looked and found rook d5, 
D8. Root D4, exclaim. Sorry, root, not root D8. Root D4, exclaim. You were spot on, my friends. Queen, rook uh, E, uh, uh, rook C8. And then if you noticed Harry the H pawn, uh, exclaim. You are 100% on in this point. White uses his rook to defend the, his C, C pawn, uh, maintaining control over the D file and preparing to uh, for an assault on G7. He followed this with a lift loft move or lifting move that is also invaluable to his attack. Then came Queen uh, C7. Queen g3, only two half, uh, only two and a half moves have been played, and in the slightly the previous in the previous example diagram, but White's winning chances are much more visible. He will be able to play Queen, uh, I mean Rook g4, and uh, basically be. Uh, Rook g4 and meet g6 with uh, h5. Uh, one way or another, the king will be opened up. Black's problem are not solved by f4 or f5. For this, for this example, what because white can build up pressure with king h2, f4, and then h5. And queen g6 and k and rook d uh, d uh, eight or d6. See what we're going to talk about. I'll show you. Uh, let me see. Oh, h5 here. Okay. What they're talking about is uh, f5 doesn't solve the problem here at all either. Because uh, you actually can now play potentially uh, king h2, f4, and then you can uh, meet the the coming attack after you defend the pawn with queen one of the queen moves, and you're still good. He made a difficult concession. King, or see, uh, h5, the pawn can't last long on h5. After uh, king g6, g5 here, or queen g5, g6, white can blast open the king side with uh, g4 and kaboom, it's, it's, uh, and then uh, g4, h takes g, root takes g, and then uh, an h5 will fall at that point. Uh, pawn h5 for uh, white. Instead, black sought counterplay on the other wing. And the game went with uh, queen g5, again. Uh, queen c5. Rook uh, f4, queen a3, then king h2, queen takes a2, queen takes h5, rook f8, queen d1. Queen a5, and then queen e2. These are kind of odd moves. I know you're thinking, what? In the, what's the idea about uh, queen uh, uh, d1, right? You know what the idea is, of course. 
h4, I mean h5, h6. That's the idea. We we taught we just talked about how uh, white wants to blast the king side's uh, basically wall apart, and the only way to do that is h5, h6, and then black will have to concede with g6. And at that point, we can uh, then target that with uh, potentially queen. Um, g4 and back and then we can even play rook f6 and then take rook takes f6 and then threaten me there's a whole bunch this move is huge so what um, the reason a5 was played of course you see is it's to uh, attack this pawn here black's got to keep the threats otherwise what's going to come to pass is this move here and uh, then the, the king's going to be in a lot of problems. Queen e2, rook d8. This, this is what. Um, Black wants to play now. Put some uh, pressure on White's position here. The most natural way to continue it to, is to convert uh, advance his pawn to h5, and and then double heavy pieces on g7 and try to attack on g7. This takes a while to exec uh, execute. But black found no defense. The game played with h5 like what we talked about. There's really not much that uh, black can do with, with h5 coming in. So the queen's trying uh, to trade off. And then um, white's like, forget that. I'm, I'm the one who's in the lead here. We're not, that's not going to happen. Then queen uh, e1. Queen g5 with the idea of uh, rook uh, g4. Rook d1. Rook g4. Now you're threatening mate. Only move to uh, get the party started is queen uh, g1. King g3, g6, h takes uh, uh, g6, and and white won the game here. If you notice, one thing that stands out here is that how white had a plan and kept with their plan. They uh, white had the space edge here. And all white did, they didn't do anything that's, you know, a magnificent move. All they, all they did was use their spatial advantage. They, they saw, you know what, that this target gets weak, and it's like, why not take advantage of it? Defend the pawn on c4, and also play rook g4 and queen uh, g3, and then all the material is protected, and you're still attacking. And and then with uh, when c uh, eight comes. You uh, we played uh, the in between. Uh, we played a, an interesting continuation because we know that we want to go for the attack on H um, on G seven, and so we have to get Harry in. If we can lock down with uh, H five, then we're winning with our play. So Queen uh, C uh, seven. And we played at that point g3 to protect the pawn on e5, also attack. And they had to uh, concede, have a concession with uh, h5. And after queen g g5, black had to try something altogether different. And uh, this right here, rook uh, d uh, or f4 was uh, playing into an idea of if the queen walks off of e7, 
the, the uh, a3 to uh, f8 diagonal. The queen then could also, we can play here and then take advantage of f7. So queen a there, king up, because we don't want any uh, checks. To, uh, and what would happen is uh, the, the if, if we got a check in the king, the queen could actually go to c1, king goes to h2, and then there's going to be a problem. So they, black, white just sidestepped that, and uh, we're not really worried. And of course, we uh, now see why queen d1 is to go h5, h6. And that's actually potentially what happened. And you'll start, you'll probably be saying, how did, uh, you know, chess cruncher see this? It's, you start getting those uh, eye, eyes of uh, visualization and you realize once to keep your plan going but stop your opponents is a vital idea. And so, g6 and then the game ended. Now the next section is pretty cool. Let's see how much time we got. Perfect. We got plenty of time. We can do maybe a couple more. This is great. We're doing excellent today. Let's get our the other position set up here. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. It's white to move here. on Vinic. Nineteen sixty two. Oops. One sec, let me get a drink and then we'll start. Okay. Material imbalance. When material is not equal, but slightly out of balance, the positional advantages usually decide the outcome. This is, this is most evident, evident when a player gives up an exchange for one or two uh, pawns. If it's a difficulty, if it's if it's a diff difference of one pawn, the player with the rook is marginally ahead. If it is two pawns, the pl the other player holds uh, an equal or small edge. In either case, the edge may not be enough to win without positional pluses. Few people understood that better than the sixth time world champion uh, Michael uh, Michael von Wienick. Okay, White's uh, previous move 
Oh, the, oh, the section inside of playable, uh, winnable on chapter six is material imbalance. So I just want to tell you what we were reading from. White's previous moves uh, were designed to grab uh, a on E to grab on E four. Uh, the extra pawn after bishop takes black will reply. So what was actually played here is this was played here. So after uh, after uh, taking bishop takes e4, black will reply with bishop h3. And that's what, what black replied with. The threat of bishop takes f1 and rook takes e4. Uh, white uh, does have a difficult uh, have a defense to both these threats uh, and it would be bishop g2 or uh, white does sorry white has a threat to that uh, then uh, queen takes d1 rook takes d1 queen takes g2 and uh, rook takes e1 and then d7 I'll show you right here this is what we're talking about here. First of all, queen takes, takes, bishop takes, king takes, rook takes, and then rook d7. Uh, sure, he has has the better position, but is it enough? So after this move here, um, white had to say, white had to look at the position and figure out an exclaim move. This was just the line we were looking at. Stop right now and see if you can find the move that uh, uh, Mikhail uh, Va uh, Von Wienick played white to move and basically a winning position. Okay, if you uh, stopped it and you went over it and then you're joining us, the proper move, the best move is queen c2. And this is an exclaim move. Because you're, what you're doing is you're you're giving up the exchange, but what what you're going to have is material in uh, in balance. Then came, of course, bishop takes f1, king takes f1. White is certain uh, certain to win a second pawn on h7, uh, or potentially win a pawn uh, on b. These two points are vulnerable. For, uh, for black. But what is what is much more important is that by eliminating black's bishop, he dominates the light squares. Black will be unable to use his rooks because he, ha he has to worry about kingside mating threats uh, on h7 targets. And so black found the best defense which was knight to uh, d6. And then uh, bishop takes uh, d6, queen takes d6. That gave white a choice uh, to cap uh, which pawn to capture. A good argument can be made to, in favor of uh, bishop takes uh, b7. Uh, but after, so this, there could be an argument for this move here. And then queen c, uh, c6, uh, followed by a4 to keep his extra two pawns. But this will leave uh, the how question. Creating a pass pawn on the queen side doesn't seem possible. That's why white chose altogether a different move continuation. That's why he chose uh, bishop takes h6. Now this is a uh, threatening idea to win material here because the queen potentially will go to uh, queen to g6 and then queen h5 uh, and bishop g6 check and then the a mating threat potentially would uh, arrive. 
and would also get the rook back with an advantage of an extra pawn for white. So with this move here, rook a d1. Hey, how you doing? Rook a d1 was played. Uh, knight f3. And we got to get more reinforcements brought into the fight. Uh, okay, this is easier to win because of the inability of Black's rook and bishops to defend his light squares um, weaknesses, such as uh, G, the g6 square and the h7 square. For example, the, well, we're going to do the move that Black played, which was actually um, rook uh, to f8. Oh, what? Oops, I have to promote this because this is the correct line. Okay, rook f8. But we're going to go back and uh, we're going to take a look at if the queen got a little too greedy. And played, um, oops, hold on, after this. If queen takes uh, a3, that's, I'm glad, uh, yeah, I'm having a good day too and I'm having fun. Nice. Glad. And uh, this idea is wrong because of a couple reasons. Oops, I have to get Put this up so y'all can see the board. It allows white to get counterplay. It allows white's idea of queen uh, f5 and queen to h5. This is the idea. White doesn't really much mind if they lose a pawn because the whole idea is checkmate. And checkmate is the, the name of the game in chess. And so Giving up a pawn for me, uh, that wouldn't bother me. And so that's why this gets an, a mistake mark on it. Bishop g6. First, you could play this one or a queen. Probably this has more threat to it. You'd have to, you gotta be as a huge amount of forcing. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of our studies that we're going over. We're going over what it takes to become a master. We're working through um, the book and learning uh, right alongside with uh, Andrew Solstice on uh, uh, how what the thinking, uh, the way of thinking. Yeah, it is good, isn't it? I'm not sure how to do that, so so I'm I'll have to figure out how to um, allow other uh, members to be part of this. <laughs> so I yeah, I'll have to look into how to do that. But you know what? The whole idea about bishop uh, uh, g6 is actually a better move. I sh I actually should have seen that one because this is it's the most forcing. Oh, okay, I will see really quick. Let me see, how do I, I add a member? Okay, I'll give you a shot. Let me see. There we go. So that's how you do it. Okay, good. Hey, that's cool. Alrighty. 
And so the uh, idea for uh, this is so that you can play in here and basically threaten some mate. You're also threatening the rook at the same time. There's a lot. That's that's the idea behind it. Queen f5, like we talked about. Yep. And then h5. And the threat would be winning material. They, see, they even, Andrew Sullivan even talked about our idea. The idea after this of here, I'll show you, about this moving in and then the queen coming over. Both work. But I like uh, um, Mikhail von Venix, uh idea of uh, bishop g6. I think that's more forcing. Yeah. I did uh, do that. So I think you're in, so that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but we're just, uh, you can just follow along. Yeah, we don't want to move stuff around though. So this is just for following. But we don't really want that to happen. Yeah, we're just probably just going to, it's nothing, I just don't, you know what, <laughs> it's nothing against that. We're just going to keep it in view mode only. But I can see how, yeah, now that, like if you get into deep studies, I can now see, I, I learned something there. You click member if you want to invite somebody, then you add them. And if you want uh, them to contribute, like, into the setting you could just click contribute and then they can uh, you, they can come and help and like type stuff and that'd be cool but yeah so I learned something on uh, lichess.org uh, or I uh, leechess.org so you gotta you gotta learn something every day try to learn something every day for sure especially in chess to help you improve but yeah that was cool Okay, so back to what we were talking about. After rook f8, we're going to be looking at now the idea. Okay, thank you for your patience on that, yeah. But that, this now you get to see what the idea of uh, why rook f, uh, f1, f8 was played. <laughs> I had to get my uh, lines correct. Was to play uh, bishop g6. Is now there's no uh, rook on e8 to attack. That kind of the I don't know if it's considered a prophylactic move. Maybe it's just <clears throat> trying to get out of a problem. So we'll we'll call it prophylactic. But I think it's more dodging a threat in my opinion than um, actually. Pred I guess it, maybe it is predicting a move. So I guess that would be prophylactic. Uh, so it's one of those moves that it's hard to uh, decide if it is or isn't, if it's just reactive. But whatever it is, uh, white's winning here. He's got a really uh, better edge than black. We'll leave it with that. Now this uh, queen move was an important move. This was also a very, uh, it stops um, white, black from coming in to uh, um, F5 stops white from coming into F5. Black guards that square. And if you notice something, the feel of this um, game is that white's in control here. White's the one who's pushing a anything. They're, they're, they're the one that's saying, I'm in charge here and I... I'm the one that's going to be for a while having the initiative. So you kind of can, when you start to play a game and you start to feel like you're pushing your opponent's position around 
and you're starting to make your opponent react, it, that's when you have the initiative. I guess that's the best term to look at it as and uh, blacks just reacting to all of white's threats. And when you can get your opponent in that um, way of thinking, you basically, you got them. You got them. Once again, we see how, um, oops, let me see, did I, uh, queen, yeah, okay, here we go. Once again, we see how the uh, a absence of counterplay allows a player to take his time. So blacks are losing all their counterplay, and uh, Bon Vienic could actually just slowly build up, slowly, slowly, slowly. And so white plays an important move. Uh, this is a prophylactic move. This one is. So I could say that that for sure. The it has a two point uh, two ideas, probably even more that Bon Vienic saw that I'm probably not even seeing. The first one, the first one I see is that it guards h6 from the queen. Second one I see is it gets off the the back rank here. It gets off the back rank. So it co it gets off this here, this here, it gets off and it guards there. So um, if the rook ever wanted to do, if white ever wanted to do a rook lift now, and play rook b5 and potentially into uh, maybe after this bishop leaves off of the uh, d8 to uh, h4 diagonal, the rook can go to b4 and swing over to h h4 check. And there's no threats of any back rank checking, any problems. Black, white now doesn't have to worry about the king's safety. And that's really like what we looked at in the last game. The one thing that was a tide changer for the side was king safety. And so if you have a safer king, that means you can start pushing and attacking. You don't have to worry about your king coming under fire. Black's king is very, very vulnerable. He needs to bring his guards back fast. Otherwise, what's going to happen is his, an army is going to overwhelm him. And Black's going to go down in flames. And his the history of Black in this game will be sad. Okay. Um, let's see. Then came rook d5. And uh, white played bishop pawn e4 exclaim. This is a really, really strong move. This uh, allows uh, for a lot of an attack to happen. This attacks the rook and prepares to play uh, e5 here. e5 is a power move, pawn e5. And also the weak uh, c7 pawn e5 um, as well potentially I'm trying to think also what what they can do here I think it's all based on getting rid of the dark squared bishop and removing it from the d8 to h4 diagonal which would allow a lot more attacking options for white and you just got to look at these as uh, potential uh, positions. Also, there is a the bishop can go to f5 if need be. That's an idea too. The pawn also allows uh, the bishop to retreat back if to attack the queen. There's a whole bunch of ideas with just e4. It's a very uh, flexible move. Now the rook. Uh, yeah, you have to be careful on this. If the rook went back here, of course, now you get to see one of Bon Vienic's ideas was uh, bishop to f5 here, and an exchange uh, goes goes bye bye. He'll be he'll trade his light square bishop for the rook and be up in exchange. Actually, not exchange. Sorry. Uh, let me see. There's four pawns. We have. We have six, two pawns, sorry, one wouldn't be an exchange. It would just be uh, two pawns. And that's enough for Bon Vienic truly to convert a win. Okay. 
Now in comes the idea of before exclaim. And uh, he begins to plan for e5. And if bishop takes e5, then the rook will slide over to h5. And it's not looking too good for our friend, the black king, at that point. Not, not, not so. Uh, whatever. Yikes. No. Okay. Bishop e7. This is a kind of a forest move. You have to start retreating the pieces back. Just retreat, retreat, retreat. Now the bishop comes to f5. The other idea is uh, to attack the queen and uh, prepare for more infiltration ideas, maybe of uh, knight e5 and knight into this something like this this here and then potentially you're forking the king and the uh, and the bishop at that point so that's kind of an idea that von Wienick wants to play and uh, queen h6 okay White's positional edge has grown so great that he has an alternate winning idea. Rook uh, c4 was actually played here. But let's see if the alternate... Oh! You can actually play queen takes uh, c, bishop d8. Queen takes b, uh, b7. And now they're... Uh, now the material advantage is so great here that and the followed by uh, creating a pass queenside pawn he's preferred at that point he's, this is even a better line not even risking anything bishop d8 and then e5 and the pawn is passed well it's passed anyways but it's getting closer and closer to touchdown. Uh, rook d5. Knight h4. Exclaim. and then queen c3 <clears throat> the knight now covers the bishop and uh, potentially a, uh, a swinger could happen you can bring the rook over and start pushing the pawn Okay, let me see here. Okay, king h8. Rook f4. Cover the pawn and free up the bishop for an attack. Rook d5. And then queen f3. Exclaim. This idea is getting ready to uh, do a check here and then basically pick up the entire kingdom. And he resigned here. Also the rooks under fire. So like if um, there is a resignation at this point. So I'm going to put he's uh, superior. Uh, white is winning. 
And so if the rook comes to d2, then you have check here. If the king comes up, You have check, or you have win there, and if this gets played here, bishop check, king up, and then bishop f f five is me, and that that's just just total impressive right there. That's just so beautiful. Let's see how we're doing for time. Perfect. We'll end on this because we're going to be starting a whole nother um, section here. So that's good. Many players think that the best way to learn uh, what uh, it takes to win a game is to lock themselves in a room with end game books. Bad idea. Better idea, find games in which one side wins after creating slight material imbalances. Uh, let's see. Oh, slight material, uh, uh, slight material imbalance. Like exchanging an exchange for a pawn. These games, if, uh, you got to underline that because that's a really good idea. That, yeah. So, material imbalance, hold on. Okay. Like an exchange for a pawn. Um, I want to just underline that. These games, if you're not just uh, sacrificing, uh, like a mating attack, not not for just a mating attack. It's not just sacrificial. Will underline the importance of positional advantages. Some databases will allow you to find lots of games like that. They should be. Uh, uh, excite an excellent study, like exciting uh, study material for you to go over. Okay, then with that, because we'll pick up uh, uh, the next section in our um, play tomorrow. Alrighty. So, do you have any questions on what we priorly went over? Because then, uh, if not, we'll do a summary wrap up, and then I gotta say, uh, then I gotta log off for the night. Give you a minute to type in just in case if there's a lag. Okay, no, it nothing. Okay, then we'll do a we'll do a quick wrap up, and then we'll we'll end. There are, there are many, many examples of that. A pass pawn, a positional advantage, turns out to be superior to an extra pawn. Material, uh, a material advantage, yet the golden rule is difficult for many learners to accept. Part of the reason is that they're confused by the somewhat vague, somewhat imposing word positional. If you if we re, uh, replace it with non-material, they'll have an easier time grasping the position like that, and f that uh, grasping that the the idea behind it. So what we noticed in the first one was that um, White had uh, a positional advantage with the bishop back here. I'll show you. We'll go to the, to this one here. I think this is is this the one? Nope. Sorry, it's the it's the Rubenstein. Rubenstein one here. White had a, an advantage here because of the placement of his bishop and the amount of threats that White could implement. And it, it was an equal position. There's there was a knight for a bishop, right? Three pawns. You would think, wow, equal. The queens equal. The pawns equal. You know, but the one uh, trump hand or trump card that they had or position is that the queen can make for white all the threats because of black's one thing, the weakness of the king. The bishop covers h7, and that's a vital importance for um, the position. The king's safety in this one was, was paramount. And then the next one that we went over 
um, which was uh, this one here, I don't know how to pronounce the players' names, was also an important uh, setup because we, we learned that the, this was material imbalances now, that when you do a sacrificial, did, did I skip one right too fast? Yes, I did. Let me see where, all oh, right, here we go. Hold on, let me make sure I'm in the right section. Yep, okay, after that, perfect. All right, we've learned from this one that the space advantage was what turned the tide for um, uh, white, was that advantage was space, and this, even though there were these weaknesses, white on C4 uh, and E5, white was able to use all the king side vulnerability and uh, by to their advantage and they played rook d4 and then h uh, h4 and then the idea of h5 and trying to slowly uh, basically open up the king side and win and then the one that i like the most uh, i like this one that was a strong one slowly squeezing and winning but the Bonvenic one was just out of this world impressive. To uh, he Bonvenic saw that Bishop takes e4. The whole idea was based on allowing this exchange, this uh, uh, positional exchange, so that uh, he, they would be able to take advantage of h7 and b7. Uh, he realized that. The light squared bishop was the most powerful piece for black. By getting rid of the light squared bishop, Bonvenic was able to play on against all of black's light squared vulnerabilities. And that's what uh, he did in the game and won. So that was the positional um, advantage or the imbalance that uh, we talked talked about. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a, a little quick read here. When the material is not equal, but only slightly out of, out of balance, positional advantages usually decide the outcome. This must, uh, this is a must uh, when a player gives up an exchange for one or two pawns. If not, if it's a difficult, uh, if it's the difference of one pawn, then, uh, and rather than a rook, let's say you get a, uh, for the a rook, you only get a pawn and a bishop. Then um, black has a slight advantage, but like in this one, they were able to get lots of material. How you doing? We're gonna we're wrapping up on this one. But if they uh, get two pawns, the player has an e an equal advantage. In either case, it, uh, let me let me reread that really quick. Just really quick, and I'll be efficient with it. When material is not equal, but only slightly out of balance. The positional advantage, advantages usually decide the outcome. This is most evident when a player gives up an exchange for one or two pawns. If it's a, a difference of one pawn, the player with the rook is marginally ahead. If it is two pawns, the other player holds a slight small to equal edge. In either case, the edge may not be enough to win without positional pluses. Few players understood that better than the six-time world champion Mikhail von Wienick. And we're going to wrap up on that because I know that I've learned uh, that reviewing a position and then talking about it, then reviewing it, talking about it, then reviewing it, and then one last talk about it. Some reason it helps um, ingrain it into the brain that the Lord Jesus has given us that we are able to uh, simulate it better. I don't know what it is, but that's just I've found that it works really good for me. And so I wanted to uh, try that to help uh, you improve as well. Okay, with that, we're going to log off on this. I wanted to uh, thank you all for participating. I'm learning how to uh, use the... Uh, the add the member to uh, uh, leechess.org and so I'll have to look into that and we'll start improving and uh, I'll, I'll do that but what we have to always remember though is that 
choices, positional advantages, choices, um, imbalances, and all, all that is important. But there's one thing that's as important, and the, the importance of receiving the Lord Jesus, Lord and Savior of your life, is a vital decision that we all have to make. And uh, it's an imbalance, too, that we have to decide one day what are we going to do with the Lord Jesus. Bruce Lee talked about a similar idea. Now we get to see what Bruce Lee meant by taking what you know, and my friends, and being willing to do something with it. And always applying it to your life. It may, it may be the field that you're in, but chess helps in every area of your life because it helps with uh, tactical thinking, uh, strategic, and planning. And uh, you'll, uh, you'll keep improving uh, and getting better in every area to when you study. And that's why the Team Chess Crutcher motto is in place. And that's why we always talk about that you have to hang up your coats, uh, you have to hang up your hats, and you have to sit down and study when most won't. Team Chess Cruncher does, and that makes all the difference. And as Wesley so says, serve the Lord Jesus, and as I say, God bless. And I'll see you next time on Chess Cruncher TV. Have a blessed morning, afternoon, and evening. Lord willing, I'll be back on tomorrow. We'll keep pushing forward and improving and getting better. And what you have to remember, why we always talk about Colonel, uh, uh, Colonel Hannibal Smith is that even inside of a random position, there's always a plan. And we're seeing that through um, Andrew Solstice's book, What It Takes to uh, Become a, a Chess Master, that there's always a plan. Maybe it's a peace sacrifice. Maybe it's a positional slight edge, bishop versus knight. But there's always a plan, my friends. And when you find it, you get to say, I love it when a plan comes together. OK, two thumbs up, hoorah, be blessed. And uh, again, thank you for logging on. And uh, have uh, a blessed night tonight. And keep studying chess and having fun. I'll see you then. Be blessed. Bye-bye.